Welcome to the Storied Outdoors. My name is Brad Hill, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host Brian Gill. And we are uh, so excited today to uh, have a, a good friend and a co-worker, Kyle Bashirs for me. Kyle is a campus pastor here at Mars Hill Church in Mobile, Alabama. He holds a PhD from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, teaches courses on religion at the University of Mobile, and is an author of a recently published Apathyism um, book with b uh, Publishing, um, How We Share When They Don't Care. Kyle's favorite spaces for Sabbath are in the cockpit of a kayak and among the peace of the Woodlands Trail. So, man, I'm so thankful you joined us, buddy. Yeah, I'm so thankful you asked me, and it's a joy and a privilege to be on the show. Yeah, man. Kyle, oh, so good to see you, man. We uh. I think last time we were hanging out, we were around some pancakes in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, that's, that's right. right, man. The pancake pantry. They're delicious. Oh, my gosh, man. Such a good memory. But uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us, buddy. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. One of the um, one of the things that you also did where you, you served in the Air Force and you lived in Europe. Um, what, what was that like? And, and were there any experiences that stick out for you from, uh, from your time there? Uh, yeah, I did. I did. I um, was was in the Air Force. Um, I spent a, almost a total of seven years over there uh, between Germany and England. And uh, I mean, you live in Europe, being an American, you ask about a specific experience. Yeah, there's a lot to be <laughs> it's said. There's a ton, right? There's a ton. And every it was, Thursday. <laughs> yeah, every Thursday, right. But uh, it was actually uh, living in Germany that got me into the outdoors. And, really? Uh, you know, I, I, I grew up um, in a Chicago suburb and uh, not a whole lot of outdoors going on there. <laughs> Some skating. <I> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, I kind of fell in love with hiking and uh, camping mm. uh, in Germany. But probably the biggest experience, the one I'm most grateful for was an opportunity I had to go to Spain on a pilgrimage uh, with my brother. At the time, he came to live with me and my wife over a summer, uh, I think between his like 10th and 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took two and a half weeks off and literally went backpacking through Europe on this ancient pilgrimage. Oh, my wow. gosh. That's one of the things I would. Oh, I'm so jealous. I would have loved to have done that. Yeah. And so is this a particular trail or pilgrimage that you guys went on? Yeah, it's a, it's a network of trails that all okay. kind of converge at this city in Galicia, which is in northwest Spain, right above Portugal. Okay. And uh, the town there is uh, Santiago de Compostela. And it's uh, supposed to be where the remains of the Apostle James are. But it's the termination of this very ancient pilgrimage that Christians have been going on literally for centuries and wow. you can start in rome you can start in berlin you can start in london even though you gotta do maybe a little swimming <laughs> to get across the channel catch, uh, catch but, the train yeah, yeah but but it all converges on this trail and uh yeah you, you end there uh, in in santiago so you guys struck out from germany no, 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 that would have taken us way too long. No, we, <laughs> we, took the sh we took a shortcut with an airplane. There we go. Yeah, right, so, so we, we, uh, we got to Santiago. We took a bus for like five hours east, and then they dropped us off in this town. I don't even remember the name. Yeah. And uh, we, we just walked back to the airport, <laughs> basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Cal, tell us a little bit about, um, maybe for people who may not be familiar with the term pilgrimage, what does that mean and what, what does that entail? Yeah, so a pilgrimage is a time when a Christian, I mean, other religions do it too, but in specific, this pilgrimage, when, when a Christian would set aside time and resources to embark on a journey to a destination for the purpose of spiritual development. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people would do this in a sense to earn salvation or to reduce time off of purgatory. And mm -hmm. theologically, I don't think that's a very good reason to go on one. But um, having been on this pilgrimage, there is a lot of life lessons you can learn, uh, little things about being with people, um, walking towards a destination where you can finally let go of the baggage you've been holding on to, um, participating in a church service with other saints who have been on the same hmm. journey that you have been on was, was, was a really great parable, I guess, for the Christian life. 
so I recommend if you can <laughs> yeah. go on the pilgrimage. It was a, it was great. Yeah. Literal baggage. So you're taking your backpack off, but then there's a lot of spiritual baggage too, that you can take off. Oh, right? for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. You, you've been carrying this bag for weeks, sometimes even months. And then there was a, when we finally got to the end, uh, the, the, the destination is this very beautiful medieval uh, Spanish cathedral. Hmm. And uh, you're meant to get there and then participate in, in a mass in, in, in the Eucharist. Um, but my brother got, my brother and I got there and uh, there's this huge plaza right in front of the entrance to the uh, cathedral, which is, you know, representing Zion or the new Jerusalem or heaven, right? The end. And uh, we, we took our bags off. And they just collapsed to the ground, right? <laughs> and you felt this amazing weight off your shoulders. And I thought to myself, like, man, that's that's a beautiful parable, right? Yeah. I mean, in the end, that weight isn't there anymore. That that weight of brokenness, of sin, of death, it's gone. Mm. The thing you you had to carry uh, throughout your entire life. But... Well, I bet there was some. I mean, I can only imagine there were some interesting characters you met along the way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, put doing, doing mildly. yeah, I'm sure mildly. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's a very international thing. Um, sure. People assumed my brother and I were German. And I think it's because we had been outfitted with German products, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like backpack our, our backpack was... is Deuter. Uh, we, our shoes, I think were like the German brand. I don't remember some people would just come up to us and just ask us in German where from Germany we were. And then they were shocked when we were Americans. Because there's not a lot of Americans on that trip. Yeah. Um, but uh, more than being international, just people come from all different walks of life and they're there for different reasons. Most people were there for journeys of self-discovery. So for them, mm. the trail was the, the purpose and not the destination, which I think in a way defeats the point of a pilgrimage, <laughs> right? You're, you're meant to get through the, the journey so that you can get to the destination. But that's neither here nor there. I think probably the most interesting character we met was a, uh, a Japanese man who had been a mathematics professor at a university in Tokyo. And uh, my, my brother and I stayed with him at an albergue. So it's a, a hostel, oh, a hostel. really cheap hostel. Yeah. You stay in the night. And uh, he was at our, our bunk next to us. And he was in traditional, what I, I guess was traditional Japanese um, garb. Really? Yeah, yeah. And, and his his shoes were like wooden too. No. It was it was crazy. So of course we got to talk to this guy, right? Super kind, super humble guy. Was a mathematics professor in Tokyo and one day just decided to go for a walk and never came back. And that was 8 years ago. Like he went total force gump. Like <laughs> I was totally like when you said that about his shoes, when you said that about his shoes, I thought, boy, you can tell a lot about a person about what kind of shoes they wear. Where are they going? Where they been? <laughs> <laughs> so he, so he tells us about how he like hikes up to Sapporo, which is the island in the north of Japan, yeah. and then was like, "Well, why don't I go somewhere else?" And then I he came this to, far, might as well right, keep going. <laughs> went to South America. Uh, I think he went to Africa, and he had been doing the pilgrimage from, I want to say Poland, and he was nearing the end, and had just been walking for eight years. So he was a fascinating character Golly, hearing his story. Wow. But what, one of the things that, that stuck out to me for him was uh, just the unexpected, um, the mixture, I think, of the unexpected uh, rejection that he experienced during his, his time hmm. and the unexpected hospitality. So people in places he thought he would be welcomed, he wasn't. Ah. In the places he didn't think he would be welcomed, he was. He, was. Interesting. I, he had done the AT, too. By that point too so, so why not i mean right? eight years right i mean i'm sure <laughs> right. it would fit in the the, yeah. the uh, appalachian trail yeah so wow. he, he had done he had some pretty cool stories that's fascinating uh full full, full force gump on it man mm -hmm. with wood shoes wooden shoes yeah. man made little bracelets and that's how he uh funded, he funded his trip funded yeah. his journeys mm -hmm. wow it was funny right before this you you pulled out, you had a little, what looked like a little, uh, field notes manual, kind of a little, uh, what are those called? Uh, I can't remember the, there's a certain brand. I can't remember. Uh, oh, Moleskin. 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 A, little, yeah. little journal, a little journal. And you had a, a receipt in there for one of the hostels was five euros. Yeah, for, five euro. That's yeah. pretty cheap. I'm sure that's 
significantly different now. Yeah. So this was, this was a while ago. Um, but yeah, five Euro on that trail got us a bunk bed and a hot shower and three meals. If we wanted it, we could have stayed there all day. Wow. But, yeah. Yeah. That's a lot different. I love that you kept a, you kept a journal. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Writing down your thoughts and stuff from back then, be able to look back on. Yeah. Yeah. I was just looking back through it again, uh, in the past couple of days, you're kind of getting ready for this. Yeah. And, uh, I, I've forgotten how much I've forgotten <laughs> Yeah. Wow. and how much of an impact that had on me at the time. And just the raw thoughts of, uh, you know, day four, I don't like this anymore. <laughs> it's not as romantic as it used to be. My feet hurt. <laughs> I can't get to sleep at night because I'm sleeping next to snoring Russian men and <laughs> the food is making my stomach upset because I'm not used to it. And I'm getting agitated with my brother who at this time is 15 and is uh, complaining most of the time. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, just the, the lessons that you learn were, were so incredible. Um, just the things that, that I learned, I guess, from a spiritual perspective, um, like the baggage is one of them. I think another one was the, a walking stick, right? Yeah. I've heard you talk about this before. Yeah, I I had, I knew I needed a walking stick. Like everybody has these walking sticks. I didn't really know why. Uh, So I bought one. It was like the classic wooden walking stick with a little metal thing at the bottom. You hang a little, uh, a shell on the top to indicate that you're a pilgrim for people. Oh, really? A little tradition. It's fun. Hmm. And uh, the first day I used it, like my (laughs) hand, like uh you little blister got blisters i didn't really know how to use it why i was using it but i think by the third or fourth day i realized i absolutely need this thing mm. and there were times when the trail got rough where i wouldn't have been able to navigate it so well without it and i just thought to myself man isn't this like a, a good analogy for the word of god in the life of a believer that when you begin the pilgrimage of your christian walk you know, the word of God is important, but yeah. it's so unfamiliar and you fumble around it. And it's, it's, it can be peculiar, bizarre, mysterious, uh, but you know, you need it. And so <laughs> each day you were in it each month, each year, the more and more you realize you wouldn't have gotten this far without it. And the dependency you have on it, leaning on it. And there was actually, it, it, it was actually a point of protection for us too. So uh, I think it was towards the end of the, our time, my brother and I uh, came up on some wild dogs. Oh yeah, and uh, they were—we thought they were just like somebody's pets, but boy, mm. they came up to us and were barking and snarling and like, I don't know how to describe it. They were kind of like uh, bowing yeah. up, yeah, right? bowing up, kind of testing the waters of. <laughs> yeah, and the only thing we had was the sticks. Yeah, and like stabbing them back, like we probably look like idiots. I have no clue how to use them. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, that was our protection. I mean, one of us could have gotten bit if yeah, it wasn't sure. for it. And so, you know, Paul describes this as the word, the sword, right? Our word yeah. is our protection too. And so it made me, I mean, I'm sure when you read Psalm 23, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, you know, it has a whole new, yeah, whole new understanding or light sh- shown on it. Right. You know, from right. that experience. I love that. Both staff. Both staff. Both staff. <laughs> <laughs> I think another lesson too was rest. Mm. it's just as important to rest as it is to walk on that trail yeah and uh you'll come to a point of exhaustion if you don't sabbath Mm. if you don't rest Mm. and so we were we were getting to the point where in the first three or four days we're like let's just knock 40k out today let's just hammer it out yeah we we subtracted 10 (laughs) off of that for the rest (laughs) of the trip right and it ended up prolonging our our trip there but yeah you just don't have the strength and we weren't built to just go, go, go. And so mm. we spent uh, on a, on two days, I think we just dedicated to spending nine hours of sitting at a cafe without our shoes on propped up, watching other pilgrims go. Mm. And if they sat next to us, have the conversation, give words of encouragement, but just watch and rest. And those days I look back on were yeah. some of my favorites. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Would they see like the little shell hanging on there? And that was an automatic like point of conversation. Yeah. You're about half the time you're on a road, like yeah. just a regular road. But on the other half of the time you're on a, you're on a trail and, like and a I mean, bonafide, trail, hiking, bonafide trail. hiking trail Yeah, yeah. with rocks and altitude up and down elevation. And it, the, I think the closer you get to the city, the more in line it comes with an actual Roman 
road mm. that was Ooh. there a long time ago. So you're walking where people have walked for 2000 years, right? Oh, wow. Incredible. And there's these little, little villages every, you can't go five or six kilometers without hitting something, some kind of village or whatever. Sometimes the villages are as small as like four or five houses and you're just walking in between them. And uh, you get those, that little shell on there and the people know, oh, this person's doing a pilgrimage. And those people were so generous, right? We had the best sure I've like ever had in my life. Food. Yeah, yeah, giving us food or whatever. The best sure I ever had in my life was from this little lady, and it was like filled with like chocolate. Oh, little man. chocolate was amazing, but mostly it was water, and just greetings. And What's you're the you're origin there? of the shell. You know, I did some research on it, and like anything. Nobody really knows, <laughs> at, at least far as I could tell. Just got kind of started. Uh, yeah, it was. There was a couple of myths or legends about um, the shells either transporting James to that area or James transporting shells with them or something like that. I don't remember, oh. but they're everywhere and they point the direction of the of the Camino. It's kind of the logo for the mm -hmm. for the pilgrimage. So interesting, uh, you know, you go over to places in Europe where everything is so old, and you know, you come back to the states and. You know, we think something's old if it's a hundred years old and that's just, that's, that's young over there. But, you know, I wish there were something or something like that over here, you know? Yeah. So young. Um, so Kyle, you're, I love, you're a native of Chicago. Like you're a real Cubs fan where a lot of people are like, you know, they like the Cubs because of the Cubs, but you're a bona fide Chicago and Cubs fan. But now you're living and working in Mobile. Uh -huh. Like, is was the coming and working in Mobile this place where you were exposed to water? Because I know, as we mentioned in the in the introduction, like kayaking. Where mm -hmm. where did your your love for getting into kayaking come from? Was it because you, you know, because I mean, unless you're in the Great Lake up there, maybe not a lot of opportunities in in Chicago to to get in the kayak. So where was that? Where was that birth at? It is here. Oh, was it, it here? Is here for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, you definitely can, there's a lot of kayaking along out in the great lakes. You limited. I mean, you're not going out there in January, <laughs> February. Um, a little, little chilly, a little chilly. I would assume. Uh, but yeah, I got into kayaking be, because of here, this, this area. So where we live, if people are unfamiliar with it is uh, mobile and mobile has this massive bay and above the bay just to the north is this massive delta system i think it's the fourth largest in the country it's one mm. of the largest watersheds in the north american continent so you have um five rivers that converge into the into the bay and then it dumps out into the gulf of mexico so you have rivers delta bayou a bay and then open water mm -hmm. all within what 45 minutes drive it mm -hmm. depends if you go north or south you're going to hit something like that right from clear springs and cold water to brackish to the gulf coast right mm -hmm. so when we moved here uh the things i enjoyed doing the most were hiking and camping yeah no mountains down here no anymore. mountains down here no it's it's flat and uh i tried camping around here during the summer which Woof. is Mm. regrettable you tried yeah. cooking you tried cooking around yeah, I tried. Here. <laughs> so i quick i quickly learned hey, you baked yourself <laughs> i did yeah and the mosquitoes were the ones that oh, ate well that night yes, yeah. yeah so i quickly learned you know for camping down here you really only have like a three-month window in the winter or you can get into a new outdoor activity which is year round yeah and uh, i'd always wanted to try my hand at kayaking so i bought one off of craigslist like you do like you do yep. and uh gosh i don't remember where i put in first i think it was the blakely river um which is a pretty powerful river yeah so yeah, it's not right. a great idea <laughs> and uh i saw a handful of alligators the first time i went out <laughs> and i said Meh, maybe it's not for me but there is something about being out on the water that just calls back to you mm -hmm. and so i put in again at a different spot and again and again and again and that kind of I sold and got a better one, which uh, enables me to go out into the Gulf. Mm -hmm. So I worked the courage up to, you know, learn how to uh, get off the beach through waves and then get out into the Gulf. I've been as far as about 2.5 miles south of Dauphin Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I, I love being out on the water now. And it's, it's because it's a long way for, I mean, you say 2.5 miles, but 
when you're out on the water like that, that's a very, it's a long way. Yeah. The houses and stuff on the beach just <laughs> look like very tiny. tiny dots of color <laughs> yeah. on the horizon. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is, this is not a current, you know, like it, it, you're, you're talking flat water, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I yeah. wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't go out in the Gulf if it was chop, choppy. Any kind of chop. You, yeah. you wait for the right day. And officially you, you can't go beyond three miles. So if any Coast Guard members are listening and I had all of the safety precautions, like my radio, a flare, a noisemaker. Uh, I have two different um, personal flotation devices. So I wear a life preserver and then one of the inflatable ones around my nice. waist. And I have two paddles. So mm. Coast Guard and my wife, if you're listening, it's as safe as it can be. Got a lot of safe <laughs> safety redundancy right, happening right. on the. And you still have cell phone reception out there because of the the gas rigs. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I have five bars. Is when when you're that's out incredible. There. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I love Brian and Brian and Sarah. You have y'all have your kayak that's yellow, and you call it what's it called again? It's called Yacht Sea. Yacht Sea. Spelled like yacht. Yeah. so the yachts will see you so right. the yachts will see us that's <laughs> yeah, right that's hey, and we've been pulled over by the uh by the by the lake police before um to make sure everybody has the flotation devices and everything and so uh yeah that, that's yeah. that's important yeah, even on those gear. yeah even on those non-motorized ones you have to be safe yes yeah, super important and the last time or no a couple times ago i was out in the bay and then uh there were some coast guard folks out there repairing buoys and they saw me, came over, like, hey, you're a little far out. Like, I know. Yeah. And they're like, show us what you got. You sure are a long ways out here, <laughs> sir. <laughs> and they're like, all right, just want to make sure you're safe. And it's that's their job. That's what they want yeah. to do, right? So, I mean, I hear sometimes people like Coast Guard came over here and yelled at me for not having this, that, or the other thing. I was like, they're trying to save you and make their life easier. Yeah, because they don't want to fly back out <laughs> right. here to try to find exactly. you. Exactly, right. Yeah. Yeah. But Yeah, we've heard some of those stories. And we heard, we had a... a Last season had Bart Valley on right. talking about you right. know, rescues during hurricane Re- record breaking during Harvey. Harvey, yeah, yeah. pretty incredible. Um, that, that story made me laugh so much because normally when they would go out to sea, you know, you would have coordinates, you know, they're about GPS coordinates, but they were doing that with uh, like Google Maps mm-hmm. because they had addresses for people. That's hilarious. But yeah, thankful for those guys, you Absolutely. know, and what they do and yep. doing and keeping you safe. You, <clears throat> we mentioned in in the bio this idea of uh, how did you say? It? Let me look. Kyle's favorite spaces for Sabbath are in the cockpit of a kayak or among the piece of woodland trails. Mm-hmm. Un- unpack what you mean by that that idea of Sabbath. I I know what you mean, but I think that may be a foreign concept for a lot of people listening. Maybe. Yeah. So so a biblical concept of Sabbath begins with the fact that God is infinitely self dependent. And we are not. Mm. He doesn't rest. You, you see that picture in the um, the burning bush, right? So when God encounters Moses in the wilderness, there's a fire, but the bush is not consumed, which is telling us that if God is this energy, he doesn't need a fuel. Mm. So it's interesting that one of the first things God tells his people after they leave is, uh, Egypt is a command to take a break, to rest, to Sabbath, because you need to pause. And it's more than just a physical rest. It's a, it's a holistic rest. It's a mental rest. It's an emotional rest. It's a psychological rest. So yes, Sabbath sometimes means not working, but other times it means just unplugging, mm. especially in a day like ours. We constantly plug in. Yeah. Cause you're certainly working when you're in a kayak. I yes. Mean, yeah. I mean, some days so. not you, you, you go out into a still lake and you throw a anchor and I'll just sit there and read. Right. Yeah. And, and just enjoy the hearing yeah. the birds and, but for the most part, yeah, kayaking's work. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what I mean is unplugging, just being by myself, praying, enjoying creation, uh, and frankly, having some adventure sometimes. There's mm-hmm. never an uninteresting time going out. Something's going to happen Yeah. every time you go out. <laughs> you're going to yeah. be challenged or pushed some way, um, and you're, you're going to learn something. So that's what I mean. That's that's why I enjoy Sabbathing in the kayak. That's funny. I was listening to you. I mean, just taking a break from heavy stuff and listening to just a you know normal normal sort of story. Uh, Stephen Ranella, the guy that does the Mediator TV show, he has a book called uh, The American Buffalo, and he's fascinated by the buffalo. And anyway, in that story, he's he's talking about obviously going on a, a buffalo hunt, but he encountered these guys up in Alaska, 
uh, that were going to go with them. They're all going to go together on this hunt. And, uh, and they had all these stories about, you know, one of the guys was a big whitewater rafting guy and they all had wild stories about things that had happened. But he made that statement. He's like, any, anybody that spends enough time in the outdoors, you're going to end up with some kind of wild story. Yeah, yeah. You're going to have some crazy experience of something you totally didn't expect to happen. So yeah. if you spend enough time, enough volume of time out in the, in, in a kayak, you know, in the bay, you're going to see, you know, see a manatee or some crazy mm-hmm. creature, or, you know, you're going to see something funny or something wild, you know, happen. If you, for me and Brian, if we spend enough time on the rivers, you know, fishing or whatever, you're going to, you're going to see something funny or, 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 or have a good story. There's, there's never a shortage of entertainment when you get outside. <laughs> yep. Oh, so are you doing um, uh, exclusively just kind of still water, type kayaking or do you ever hit any rapids uh ever go to places that have rapids that type of thing i've only done that once there's not enough elevation where we live for there to be rapids right the the current in the rivers here is very strong um because they're kind of you know they're all ending in this bay at the same time yeah high volume yeah so if it depends on if it rains upstate if it rains upstate i mean it's it's an escalator right you (laughs) you can't go upstream you just <laughs> you've got to plan your day accordingly um so most of the time i'm just going out exploring uh i like to be around the waves and in the uh, you know, not so much the surf <laughs> yeah the surf is challenging um you, each time you do it you get a little bit better um but i like being in the swells and the waves out in the bay and, and in the gulf yeah what is it about that so- that help that kind of forces you to slow down a little bit you know, being, being in a kayak, I mean, you're, you don't have the roar of a motor, you know, and, and you're going pretty, you know, pretty slow. So yeah. it, it, it seems like for me, it helps to, for me to slow down and actually observe everything around me. I feel like my senses are more in tune. You have to be so much more aware of what's going on around you. So anybody that's been in any kind of watercraft knows that you pay a lot more attention to what's happening 360 degrees around you. You have to, it's just the nature of being out on the water, but for kayaking in specific or any kind of, you know, man powered watercraft. Um, one of the things that's so calming and terrifying at the same time is the recognition that you were just absolutely not in control <laughs> at all, mm-hmm. especially in open water. Right. So you have to position yourself and be in places where you you're in a a good position right you you need to be aware of uh the you need to be aware of the tide you need to be aware of how tall waves are and when they're coming in that kind of sets are they coming in from two different directions if they're coming in from two different directions which is common around this area it's Mm -hmm. like you're kayaking on top of a washing machine Hmm. you're just not in control at all right and uh so for me like a spiritual lesson there is uh, how often we, we try to like push against God's will in our life. And uh, with his sovereignty, we're just not the ones in charge, right? This is the famous affirmation that Jesus is Lord. He's, he's got sovereignty and kingship over the entire mm-hmm. cosmos. And so the, the faster you learn how to cooperate, with what God is doing, Mm -hmm. the faster you learn how to cooperate with the way the water and the weather is behaving that day, you'll actually find peace and rest when it does not look like there should be right. Mm -hmm. Some of the most relaxing and peaceful moments have been when I've been going out into deep water and then riding sets of waves back in Mm -hmm. like surfing. Right. Yeah. And it, it, I'm sure from afar, it looks like, Oh, he's going to tip at any moment or he's going to roll or, no, I, I've, I've learned how this water behaves and I'm going to go with it. I'm not going to try to fight against it anymore. And, and so, yeah, it's, I suppose it's a little bit of that. It's that you feel so small and something so big and you mm. feel so out of control, but you feel so grateful that it lets you be there. Mm. And there's dolphins. And there's dolphins. <laughs> Yeah, the golden retrievers of the sea. The golden ret- Man, some of them are mean. I'm pretty sure I had one pick on me one time. <laughs> really? Yeah, there was a one lone dolphin, which I've since learned is like an indication that he got kicked out of a pod or something. <laughs> and, this thing, on people. Yeah. and this thing comes up to me and I was like, oh, cool. Like they rarely 
come up to you unless they're really. It's like uh, Brian Regan. T- he talks about a flipper. He's like, what if they had a bad one called Zipper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I bet Zipper. <laughs> so Zipper, Zipper comes up to me. He's big one, like the size of my kayak, which is 14 and a half foot. Oh, so he's wow. a pretty big guy. Pretty big guy. And uh, like it comes up curious. Sometimes it happens. Most of the time it doesn't. And then he and then he like starts to like stalk me. So he's following me where I'm going. And he would get so close to the kayak that he would, you know, blow air and it would like spray me with water. <laughs> now that sounds cool, but that's terrifying yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you're like half a mile from the beach. Yeah. And uh, what am I going to do? call my wife and be like, Hey, get 911 on the phone. This dolphin's about to kick my kayak and tip me over. And I mean, I could roll back in it, but there's just something unsettling about this yeah. being picked on by it, Well, there it dolphin. is again. You're out of control. You're out like, of control. You know, like yeah. You're, you're not at the top of the food chain out no, there. <laughs> not up there. You're, you're on top of the food chain, like literally. Yeah. Yeah. Positionally. <laughs> Positionally. You're but watching the only sharks. A- there's only well, a thin kayak in between you and the yes. rest of the food chain. <laughs> little piece of plastic. Right? <laughs> Have you oh, encountered gosh. any other wildlife? Uh, any uh, any jumping? Uh, Have you had a mullet land in your kayak? Uh, well, garbs? I've had yeah, I've had a mullet jump up, and I I have a a sit in kayak, yeah. so it did. It hit the front of the kayak, and it just kind of bounced off. There was a whole school that passed when I was. Uh, uh i've seen a lot of sharks i've seen a lot of rays um i've seen a lot of dolphins one of the cool things about where we live is there's a lot of shrimping mm. yeah uh listeners may be familiar with Bayla battery yeah. uh, bubba gump shrimp from bubba the movie gump, yeah, that movie's coming back up again we live close to Bayla battery and so uh the trawlers these giant ships that throw these big nets out the back and just go at like five six seven eight knots it's really really slow um the dolphins follow behind them because they know the bycatch, the know, bycatch, it's right? The stuff that's like getting by. Yeah. So if you stay about 50, 60 yards behind the trawlers, they don't really care that you're there, but you're in the middle of a dolphin pod eating yeah. and they don't really care that you're there. Yeah. So, I mean, you could reach out your right and left hand and like touch them as they're yeah. coming up for air and going back down. They're super calm. They're being fed. They're all together. That's really, really cool. If you ever get the opportunity. Now that I'm thinking, about, I think technically the bycatch is the extra stuff that they get other than like shrimp. Like, I think that's what they call I mean, it. Bycatch. That too. I'm I talking about like the fishermen. Oh, the so fishermen whatever, whatever's yeah. in the net, they call that the bycatch. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. I mean, maybe yeah. I'm mixing that term up, but I know they're stirring things up. Oh yeah, for sure. You know where yep. those nets are and that's yep. those dolphins are following. And they're that. just like following it with their mouths open. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> lay, <laughs> lazily eating. Right. Yeah. Anyway. So that's a lot of fun. Huh. And, there, and there's a lot of pelicans. Oh yeah, there's a lot of. I mean, that's something that Brian and I love is like waterfowl and just seeing birds. Osprey. We have a lot of osprey here. There's birds that get out there so far, you would never. Yeah. I mean, seagulls are are, are so far away. Like, what are you doing out here? Yeah. I mean, you could be asking me that same question. But... <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing out here? Yeah. Yeah. Out here? But, yeah. I actually belong here. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Kyle, do you ever fish while while you're on your kayak? Are you much Man. of a fisherman? I'm not. Um, I tried it. I tried doing, you know, angler kayaking. Uh, wasn't very successful. I caught an alligator gar and decided that was my last day. Yeah, that'll cut, that'll do it. Yep, yeah, cut it and just <laughs> kind of move on. Went my merry way. Yeah, uh, those are freaky. They were those are freaky yeah, was terrifying. Creature. So like I just don't have barracuda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Freshwater barracuda. That's exactly right. I guess I could the whole. The chine, I think, is the technical term of my kayak, won't allow for, uh, you know, fighting larger fish out there. Yeah, I would capsize pretty quickly, I think. Um, and and I don't know, I I just have never gotten into fishing. Um, I want to come on a trip with you two and yeah, learn some give, fly fishing. Give it a try. I think I'd enjoy that. Yeah. Um, but no, uh-uh. there's a lot going on. I mean, to to paddle and to cast a fly rod. I mean, it's it. It's a lot going on. Uh, the guys that have the uh, the, the little pedal the pedals when they can yeah. pedals, yeah. that's and, the and key. If, yep. And if you could stand up in your kayak, I couldn't stand up in mine. Yeah. I flip so quick. But um, the ones that you can stand up and like pedal that frees up your your hands and you know you're not worrying about uh, you know um, staying put or whatever. Uh, that would be a lot. But, Shoot, man, I've seen some of them now where they have a little. They have a little motor that'll sit down. Little Minkota. Little Minkota. Like GPS little, anchors. 
Really? Oh, yeah. so the whole GPS position anchors, for you. Yeah. So it, wow. it's, uh, I, wow. I think they're getting to the point where you can have like an app on your phone and yeah. you just say, Hey, I want to stay put right here. And the Minn Kota will keep your, even in like a light, uh, like a little current. Yeah. A little current. It'll keep you in, keep you in spot. Siri, take position. me to the fish. Yeah. <laughs> take me to the fish. I mean, some of those guys, some of those, some of those rigs I've seen are probably about as much as like a small something like a nice boat yeah they're, yeah. they're putting that much money in yeah that's what uh recently i was out with uh, blake walters and we went out and we were fishing and we saw a couple of rigs like that he's like you know you can spend as much as you want on one of those or you could get like a nice boat yeah you know that you don't have to paddle you know? <laughs> yeah wow. i know so i'm not a fisherman so i don't know what the what the the logic is or the idea i'm sure there's, that's a whole world though sure, those kayak world. fishermen down world. here for yeah. sure oh, yeah. they've actually gotten into tournaments and uh, you know whole kayak fishing tournaments now really yeah it's a, it's a huge thing on lake gunnersville did i tell you about the guy in san diego uh -huh. I, I thought i told you the story so i went went out to san diego followed my wife for a business trip years ago and uh, i went kayaking i was like i obviously gotta go yeah in la jolla it was awesome i'm coming back in off the beach after renting a kayak and there's a guy who has a probably like a 14 15 foot kayak with a sail a fix to it oh wow and a shark that's about the same size as his kayak <laughs> next to it dead he <laughs> caught the shark with his kayak it's like what in the world <laughs> so I walk over to him i was like hey man i have to ask did you catch that car shark in your kayak he's like yeah i went out i was about a mile offshore this is the pacific ocean by the way oh, so you wow. ever been to like southern california big, uh, waves. big waves right big waves. yeah um pat he, I, I caught this fish it drug me for another like three miles out directly west finally caught it all by himself had to bring it back and i was like dude that's amazing he's like yeah hey could you watch my shark i need to go get my truck and then he just like walked away <laughs> never been asked that before in my life hey, can you so watch my shark? like somebody's gonna yeah. come take it hey, like, watch me yeah i was like what do you what, what do you think i'm gonna do like steal your shark <laughs> was his name ernest hemingway by the chance <laughs> <laughs> might have been but yeah it was wow. that was pretty impressive Hey, so I follow this group, <clears throat> excuse me, I follow this group on uh, Instagram. It's called um, Chesapeake Lightcraft. Are you familiar with those guys? I'm not. Mm -mm. They're, um, they're, they're wooden small boats, and uh, you can spend a week making the boat it itself. You know, Brad, you and I talked about making a fly rod for a week. Yeah. Would, you could make a, you could make a, a stand up pedal board, a wooden That's boat, cool. a little oh, kayak. Wow. Dude, I, I want to do this with my son one day, you know, make that day a project. That'd but, be pretty uh, awesome. You know, you'd have to go spend a, a week in Maine. I mean, oh, that'd be terrible. Oh, darn it. <laughs> it's just there, awful. There's something I, I would like to do. Yeah, you know, I do a little bit of whittling and, and wood carving as a hobby, but um, <clears throat> there's you whittle a, a little, little bit. Oh, I whittle a little bit. But there's <laughs> uh, mainly like Christmas ornaments. <laughs> yeah. Little gnomes. But you can uh, you can carve your own paddles for kayaks, and it's becoming more and more popular to um, carve out to make your own uh, Greenland style paddle. So have you seen oh, these? Yeah, really long. That's one you, you just got. Yeah, these, yeah. Right? I got a. It's from Gear Lab Outdoors called the Kalek, and it's uh, it's taller than me. It's probably like I don't know seven foot tall. I don't remember what it was in millimeters, but it's a it's a very it's a very skinny lean and light style of uh because yeah, yours is like carbon fiber yeah right? carbon fiber oh it, it's less it's it's so light <clears throat> and it's different from the european spoon style like the way i describe it is the european spoon style has a lot of torque right this is like your lower gears yeah um so if you want to get up and get fast and get going really quickly sure but the greenland style paddles are meant for longer excursions it's more of like your higher gears you're getting the same amount of surface on the paddle that's being pushed and the water is being pushed, but it takes a little bit to get up to speed. But once you get up to speed, man, it's just, it feels like ice skating. I don't know how else to describe it. Wow. Great, great. They're great paddles. I, I am done. I'm not using European style paddles anymore. I won't go back, but it takes a little bit of getting used to, but anyway, you can make your own. Oh, that's neat. Um, tons of videos on, on the internet and some people just get really, really into it. Beautiful like i'm sure different styles and they're doing inlays with like cherry wood and yeah i'd love to do something like that that's really cool shifting gears a little bit kyle uh, 
you part of your world is um, higher education and um, and writing. What um, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, talk uh, tell us a little bit about apathyism. Sure. So apathyism is something I think we're seeing increasing in our secular culture. What I mean by secular is any kind of society where belief in God is contestable and diverse. Mm. So you don't have to believe in God if you don't want to. And if you believe in God, you can kind of believe in him or it, however you want to. And so 500 years ago in Western civilization, that would have been unthinkable. Right? Mm-hmm. Atheists were as rare as unicorns. Um, but today, <laughs> we just take for granted secularism. Yeah. And uh, I, I think one of the products of a secular society such as ours that is also distracted, that has a lot of its needs met, is uh, that, that God becomes less and less important to the point where you might take a position where you find him so irrelevant that you don't care at all about questions relating to God or his existence. It's different from like a- atheism or agnosticism, where those positions are saying, you know, hey, I don't believe in God, or I don't think we can know God. And apathyism would say like, like, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah. I find it irrelevant. So like Richard Dawkins, a famous atheist would be frustrated in a conversation with an apathyist. Like, How can you not care? Like you need to care because it's a mind virus and we got to blah, 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 blah. Right. So uh, yeah, it, I, I wrote a book on it. Uh, part of my PhD studies was exploring it from kind of a Christian philosophical perspective. You know, what is it? Why is it here? And, and how might a Christian think through um, indifference to God? How might we engage in difference to God in, mm. in our culture? Was there a, um, was that over the course of, of time you noticed it in the, this concept or is there a couple of encounters that made you go, yeah, Oh, well, so, hold on a second. There's right. something happening here. Around back to the beginning of the interview was in yeah, Europe. I was curious about that. Yeah. Europe. I, over a decade ago is when I started noticing mm. that, um, wasn't that people were angry or hostile to God. They just didn't care. Sure, right. It was like, what do you think about last week's episode of antiques Roadshow? <laughs> I don't. Right? <laughs> so what do you think about God? I don't, I don't care. And, hmm. uh, it was actually a chance encounter with a Muslim man in, uh, in England who was proselytizing, hmm. handing out tracks, trying to convert people to Islam that, uh, in a conversation with him, I told him I was a Christian and, uh, you know, active participant of a church. And, uh, he's like, Oh, you, you kind of get where I'm coming from. I'm like, I don't, (laughs) but go on. But what he meant was nobody cares about God here. And that was the first time like a light bulb went off. I was like, Oh my gosh, he's right. He's experiencing it day after day after day. Nobody's having an argument with them. They're just not stopping because they don't care. And I was like, wow, that's why a lot of the spiritual conversations I've started to have over the years of that really panned out. And, uh, so seeing it there and then watching it grow over here in the years since was one of the motivators to kind of explore it. Fascinating. And so you wrote the book through uh, B&H Publishing. Mm-hmm. Are you, um, are you, is it, is it something that would be for people in higher education or is it something for pastors or is it anybody? What, who's it geared towards? Who's the focus? It's pretty much anybody. Yes. From, yeah, from yeah. my perspective, it's, it's, I felt like anyone could approach it and, and um, yeah. benefit from it. Yeah. yeah it's for anyone. It, I tried to hit that middle ground between somebody in Christian higher education. This is not going to be an academic, you know, treatise on the topic that's mm-hmm. yet to be written. And if anybody's out there and interested, ironically, I think that need, that work needs to be done. Um, <laughs> but yeah, anyone from like high school level to college age to adults, it would be good for pastors. It would be good for small groups to do. We have little questions I, that you can download on the internet and uh, think through it as a group together. But yeah, that's cool, and that can be found on Amazon too, right? Correct. Yeah, if people yeah. want to get a copy, we'll definitely really put that cool. in the uh, show notes. Yeah, I love that. That's good. So being in higher ed, um, you know, that's that's kind of my world, and um, I, it's kind of um, it's kind of interesting, kind of what it does to your mind. I think just being around academics and being around this, this world uh, it's, it's changed the way that I feel like I kind of 
uh, I guess the way that I've approached my my faith and the, the, the way that I've approached um, thinking about my faith. Uh, have you found that in in your in your instances? I mean, from your PhD work to to where you are instructing and everything now. For sure, and, and in more ways that I think I can articulate. Mm-hmm. Um, it has really given me a new perspective on what it means to you know love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, mm-hmm. strength. Right. So, our love of God as believers is holistic. It incorporates all of us. And uh, what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your mind? It means to always bear in mind uh, the lordship of Jesus, even over the way we think and what we think and why we think, um, which gives us parameters, but it also encourages us and challenges us to to do well with (laughs) the way we think. Mm. I think uh, thinking and studying research and writing are forms of worship. They can be. And uh, that's one of the things I challenge my students with, right? Uh, one of the classes I teach, we have a really big research project that's due at the end of the semester. And I tell them, like, you're writing this for a grade, sure, but this is a worship time. Like, yeah. love the Lord your God with your mind well when you're working on this. So, yeah. so that's kind of probably the biggest takeaway, practically speaking. For yeah. Me. I mean, and it takes it, it takes a, a different perspective on that. You know, <clears throat> when we look at worship as something that's not just what we do on Sundays, but it's what we do at our job, it's what we do with our, our hobbies, with our Sabbath. Everything that we do is, is as worship. It changes the perspective. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think that dovetails into that, you know, our mentality about what Sabbath is, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's, it's a much larger, you know, than just going to church or, and not doing anything on Sunday. Right. You know, it's... Um, I've quoted this before, I think, on here, Eugene Peterson, when he talked about Sabbath was uh, equal parts uh, prayer and play, you know, mm-hmm. like, like mm-hmm. I wanna, he spent some time in, in prayer and in worship, but he also like there's that, that time for play yeah. also. And I always uh, really appreciated that analogy as like enjoying God forever, you know, as part of our existence. Yeah. And, and so that can also come into worship as well as like, how do we worship and, and u- utilizing our gifts and our talents and our mind to, to engage, you know, information, uh, and engage knowing, knowing God, knowing God more. Mm-hmm. Um, as we usually, as we close these, our, our favorite question to, to end the conversation is what's, what's your next adventure, Kyle? <laughs> I don't know. I'm writing another book. I think that's kind of an adventure. That's yeah. definitely an adventure. <laughs> Um, anytime you stare at a screen and there's a blinking, blinking cursor cursor yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like it's cursing at you that's definitely <laughs> an, <laughs> that's definitely an adventure um we have a toddler that's definitely an adventure every day yeah um i like for outdoors things i don't know i don't know yeah. i i uh i <laughs> i have this dream of kayaking down the alabama river Awesome. I'd love to do that. I also have a dream of island hopping from um, one of the large islands south of Alabama uh, over to Mississippi, which I think would be a lot of fun. There's a lot of sandbars out there. So oh, that's yeah. kind of a, a big, I would need a group of people to come with me. You can't do yeah. that by yourself. But so hopefully I get to do all of those things. Yeah. Cool. Wow. Kyle, Let's... thank you so much for joining us today, man. It's been a fascinating conversation. It's making me really get the itch to be, uh, to do more kayaking. You know, we, we are pretty much <laughs> localized to Lake Gunnersville when we, when we kayak. Uh, but, I uh, I would love to do some sea kayaking, uh, at some point with you guys. Yeah. Come on yeah. down. We'll You've go. done that before. Haven't you, Brian? Haven't you I have done a, like a sea yeah. kayaking trip before was, was it Andy? Yeah. Andy and I did it. We, yeah, you know, talking about the surf, uh, it was tw- about 12 foot waves. <laughs> oh, that, no. that first no, break no. was really hard to get past. Um, yeah. but once, you know, once you got past it, it was, it was pretty smooth, but, uh, you rode them in like, uh, like you were surfing. I mean, it was, yep. Yep. That's it was, pretty cool. it was pretty cool. It's, you know, once you got to pass the fact that, you know, Hey, I'm not actually going to die. Um, this is pretty fun. <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is about surf is, the most challenging part of getting out into the open water is the only place where you can stand up, Yeah, <laughs> you know, like 
yeah. you roll okay as long as you don't hit your head or you don't get crushed just stand up and grab your kayak and try again yeah, right? yeah, yeah. roll out yeah. in the open water is yeah. a, bit different. <laughs> a little bit different yeah <laughs> anyway and it's very dark out there yeah very dark and you don't know what's beneath that water correct man well this has been a fun conversation um yeah, just to it. hear we covered a lot of ground too and we went from uh, European pilgrimage hiking to kayaking to apathism and academia. So we covered some, uh, to zippy, <laughs> to zippy, <laughs> zippy, <laughs> the, zippy, the <laughs> zipper, the evil dolphin attacking Kyle, oh, that guy, that guy, he would have a, you know, one of those evil laughs. I'm not going to try to replicate that. Oh, I can hear it. <laughs> it wouldn't be that cute little head. squeaky one. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> funny. Man, it would, it would be the sweetie one, but very slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Well, oh man, man, that's fun. That's great. Well, what a great conversation. Uh, we're thankful for you to take time, Kyle, to spend uh, spend with us on a Monday morning. Um, and uh, yeah, share these stories and uh, and your reflections on those. So thank you for that, man. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show, guys. And uh, <clears throat> we're we're grateful for everybody that listens. Um, we don't take for granted people's listenership and, and dialing into each of these conversations. And, uh, so we're thankful for each of you that listens. If you want to, uh, you know, help grow the podcast, you leave a, uh, leave us a review and, um, more importantly, even share it with somebody who you think of. maybe you have, a, again, each story, there's a little something different. So like you may have that person that loves kayaking. They'd love to hear some stories about kayaking or, or Kyle's experiences, share that, uh, share that with a friend and, uh, we hope, uh, we hope these stories encourage you and challenge you to uh, write your own stories and share your own adventures in the storied outdoors. 